Good morning, you guys. How's everybody doing? We still hanging in there? Kind of crazy things going on across the world stage right now. But our God is still faithful and still good. Amen? Well, we are reading in the book of 1 Samuel again, chapters 11 through 15. And last week, Saul was made king. And in 1 Samuel, well, not really last week, you know what I mean, <laughs> where we were reading in 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel 11, we see this confirmed. Saul was the king of Israel now, but he still worked in the fields. Good morning, Diane. We open up with a pretty gruesome threat, y'all. Nahash the Ammonite threatened to attack Jabesh Gilead, or Jabesh Gilead, and gouge out everyone's right eye. Ugh. Just a reminder, the Ammonites and Moabites are related, you know, to the Israelites, both sons of, of Lot through incest with his own daughters. In the Bible, the Ammonites are described as being descendants of ben -Ami, who was, that's funny, ben -Ami, as an enemy, <laughs> sorry, who was the son of Lot, Abraham's nephew and Lot's younger daughter. And this is in Genesis 19, 38. So the Ammonites were a Semitic people, but they attacked God's people. This is from gotquestions.org here, what I'm about to read. When Israel left Egypt, the Ammonites refused to assist them in any way, and God punished them for their lack of support. And this is in Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 through 4. The Ammonites were a pagan people. If you remember, they worshipped the gods Milcom and Melech. God commanded the Israelites not to marry these pagans because intermarriage would lead them away to worship false gods. This is still the case today. You know, we can go off by degrees. We can worship other things without realizing it. And it's not true faith. So, Malek was this fire god and, uh, with the face of a calf. His images had arms outstretched to receive the babies who were sacrificed to him. So, like their god, the Ammonites were cruel. So, when they're coming and saying, we're going to gouge out your right eye, they mean it. Um, Jabesh Gilead, or Jabesh Gilead, was first mentioned in connection with the vengeance taken on its inhabitants because they had refused to come up to Mitzvah to take part with Israel against the tribe of Benjamin. So, and I hope I'm, I may be butching the name, sorry if I am, uh, but Jabesh Gilead was largely the Benjamite tribe. Uh, and if you recall the story that we had read uh, in Judges 19 through 21, the Levite and his concubine, uh, that Another gruesome story, uh, cutting to the chase, chase there, the town there of Jabesh Gilead, they wanted to come and violate the Levite. And instead they gave his concubine and they violated her all night long. And then the, the Levite man cuts her into a bunch of pieces and sends it to the tribes of Israel, basically saying, this is the wickedness done in Israel. This should not be done. So... Today, in our day and age, we think about these things, it's, it's really like, how do we relate to this? Well, if we look at what ISIS was doing just a few years back, I mean, there is the heart of man is desperately wicked. And apart from God, there's nothing good in us. And so we're capable of great, which is a humbling thing. And so we're seeing some of this wickedness played out here. And so uh, there's this threat and the people of Jabesh Gilead go to Saul, who happens to be a Benjamite. And so from the Benjamin tribe. Uh, and he ends up helping them and they get victory. So because of Saul's victory, he was finally made king. At the beginning of the chapter, he is king, but he's kind of still working the fields and it's confirmed by this victory that he has against the Ammonites. Have you guys ever had someone threaten you? Maybe they didn't say they were going to take out your right eye. <laughs> but I know growing up, people wanted to beat me up like all the time. I was like, what in the world? I was four foot 11, y'all. Uh, I couldn't win any fight, probably. <laughs> I wasn't a fighter. But I remember one time, um, my one of my brothers, I have two older brothers, uh, came to my defense. 
and he told people it was wrong. People were just picking on me. I guess I was a nerd. I'm still a nerd <laughs> to some degree. But people just want to beat up people for no reason. It's a power play, threaten people. But it meant so much to me that my brother would stand in the gap. And he would say, you're going to fight my sister? We got the whole band on our side. Let's go. <laughs> and they decide to, uh, we'll leave Denise alone. And I think about how Christ stands in the gap for us because the enemy is attacking us constantly. You know, he hates us, but we have Jesus who stands in the gap, amen, on our behalf, and we don't deserve that. Good morning, Nancy. Hey there, Mossy. Good to see you too. Praise God you're keeping well. I'm glad to hear that. These are tricky times. So, you know, whenever we feel threatened, we know we can go to our Abba Father. You know, we don't have to go to man for help. Our God sees us. Our God is with us. Um, and so sometimes we see with the Israelites, sometimes they were faithful to go to God and sometimes not. They kind of did things their own way sometimes. And I think we can relate at times as well. And so um, in 1 Samuel 12, Samuel gives a speech to the Israelites. <laughs> This is a speech, y'all. Samuel first asked the Israelites to be a witness for him of his faithfulness. Samuel saying, hey, have I done anything? And they're like, no, no. He's like, good, okay. I'm going to call God now as a witness against you. Why? Because the Israelites were asking for an earthly king. They already had the king of kings, God, as their leader. But they basically said, you know, we appreciate that and all, but we want man, we want man to be our king. And so this was something that greatly offended God. Let's look and pick up at uh, 1 Samuel 12, verse 6. Then Samuel said to the people, The Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and who brought your ancestors up from the land, let's just remember what God has done, is a witness. Now present yourselves. So I may confront you before the Lord about all the righteous acts he has done for you and your ancestors. God's people perpetually forgot the Lord, y'all, and the Lord would punish them. I think we can relate to this as well. There's times where I am more faithful and fervent in seeking God and times where I let life get the best of me and I just get busy and I, I seek him half-heartedly. I've been there, and this is where the Israelites are at times. Our man-centered way of thinking tends to think it is unfair and cruel for God to punish, right? When we look back and we see, oof, some heavy punishment on those Israelites. But when punishment brings them to repentance, isn't that a beautiful thing? What is more cruel, to leave someone in their sin and then eternal punishment or to punish them that they may repent. As a parent, I remember hating spanking my kids, and yes, I did spank my kids. I hated it. I'd rather get the spanking for them. Isn't that the heart of Christ? He took our punishment. But I knew that if they didn't see that there's a consequence for their actions, that they would continue in that rebellion against me and against God. And so, our man in our way thinks it's cruel, but when we realize that it's actually God's kindness, you know, to bring discomfort so we see our need of him. God continually rescued his people when they cried out. He wants us to call out to him today. But we, like the Israelites, we can tend to want to call out and get help from the creation rather than the creator. We see that in our culture. People want to numb their pain. People want to find a solution, but we don't want to be desperate before God. But it's in calling out to God that we have our greatest help. So Samuel confronts the Israelites with the fact that they asked for an earthly king rather than the heavenly king to help him, picking up in 12 verse 12. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was coming against you, you said to me, no, we must have a king reign over us even though the Lord your God is your king. Picking up in verse 18, Samuel does a little demonstration to help the people wake up and see what they have done. Samuel called on the Lord, and on that day the Lord sent thunder and rain, 
As a result, all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. You know, the fear of God helps us to live rightly. It doesn't mean that we don't have a relationship with him to fear him. It means we understand how awesome he is and how not awesome we are. <laughs> Can I just say that? We are not awesome. We need our faithful, all-powerful, omnipresent, omniscient God desperately in our lives. They pleaded with Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so we don't die. For we have added to all our sins the evil of requesting a king for ourselves. So in this moment, they get it. But unfortunately, they, they are now going through Samuel, okay? Which Samuel was their judge. But, you know, we can go directly to God. You know, have you ever had where someone's like, yeah, pray for me. I, I'm really struggling. Just pray for me in this area. But they keep rebelling. It's like, repent. Turn to God. That's what we need to do. Samuel replied, don't be afraid. Even though you've, you've committed all this evil, don't turn away from following the Lord. Instead, worship the Lord with all your heart. Don't turn away to follow worthless things that can't profit or rescue you. They are worthless. The Lord will not abandon his people because of his great name and because he has determined to make you his own people. Verse 23, as for me, I vow that I will not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. I will teach you in the right way. Above all, fear the Lord and worship him faithfully with all your heart. Consider the great things he has done for you. However, if you continue to do what is evil, both you and your king will be swept away. I love Samuel's heart for them. Hey, I'm not going to sin by not by you know, forgetting to pray for you. I'm still going to be there for you. Even though you picked a king instead of me and instead of God. <laughs> I'm still going to be there. Samuel doesn't sugarcoat things. We shouldn't sugarcoat things either. When we do, we remain in deception. We need to examine ourselves daily. We need to remember what God has done for us. If y'all journal, journaling is a great thing. Uh, this is where you write down daily, God, I'm seeking you. Or you know, you write down scriptures and if there's something that speaks to you, because you can look and see a progression sometimes where you're starting to slide backwards and we need to get back right with God. What saddens me is that God's people start to go through a human being to get to God. They really don't even go to God themselves. And this has been going on for a while anyway with judges, but it just stands out to me more here. First Sam in uh, First Samuel 13, the Israelites were at war with the Philistines. Saul decided to follow his own way of doing things rather than obeying God and Samuel. Do we see a trend here? <laughs> Picking up in 13 verses 7 through 14, Saul, however, was still at Gilgal and all his troops were gripped with fear. And he waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal and the troops were deserting him. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Then he offered the burnt offering. Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. So Saul went out to greet him, and Samuel asked, What have you done? Saul answered, When I saw the troops were deserting me, and you didn't come within the appointed days, it's all your fault, Samuel, <laughs> and the Philistines were gathering at Michmash, I thought, this is something one of my kids, I'll just say, used to always say, still does sometimes, I thought, I think, this is the best route to go instead of this is what my parents have said. This is what God has said. I thought the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal and I haven't sought the Lord's favor. Better do that. So I forced myself to offer the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, you have been foolish. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. It was at this time that the Lord would have permanently established your reign over Israel. But now your reign will not endure. The Lord has found a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not done what the Lord commanded. I find it interesting that Saul forced himself to make an offering to God. That doesn't seem like an offering anyone would want, right? I'm going to do this for you. <laughs> I'm forcing myself. God looks at the heart. So from a commentary I read this morning, just so we understand why this is such a big deal. 
Before a battle, the priest gave sacrifices to God and prayed. Not Saul, the priest would. He listened to God and he told the people what God had said. God told them how to fight. He told them how to win the battle. The Israelites trusted God to help them. Saul waited for seven days, but Samuel did not arrive. Perhaps Samuel was testing Saul to see if, God, if Saul would trust God. Saul became frightened. He could have asked God to help. Only the priest should offer the burnt offering. Saul saw that his soldiers were leaving. He panicked, right? Guys, have you ever made a decision that you realized was really not right in that moment of panic of, oh, oh the fear of man, oh, I've gotta do something instead of waiting on God. It's just wants to run ahead. Saul did not obey God. Instead, Saul did what he thought was right. That was the theme of the book of Judges, right? Each one did what was right in his own mind. Okay, so this is sin. Saul sinned in this way several times while he was king. Verses 11 through 12 show that Saul had been afraid of the situation. And that is why he acted. So don't we use those excuses? Well, I only did it because I was afraid or I only did it because I was tempted or just skip the excuses. <laughs> Samuel said that it is better to obey God than to sacrifice to him. So 1 Samuel 14, we're on, there's so much. So this is a little bit longer today. You don't have to stay the whole time. You can watch it later, sorry. <laughs> Jonathan has victory over the Philistines. I love 14 verse six. It says, Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Wow, if we would just hold on to that right now, even during this pandemic, nothing can keep the Lord from saving. He is well able. We just have to trust him in this, right? He had such genuine faith and zeal for God. He wasn't religious going through the emotions like his dad, Saul. And in the final one in verse 15, Saul strikes down the Amalekites, but does it his way. He must have like, you know, this is where Frank Sinatra got his song, I did it my way or something. <laughs> he went back and read about Saul, I don't know. But it says in verse 9 through 16, Saul and the troops spared Agag and the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and choice animals, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. They were not willing, get the words there, not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my instructions. So Samuel became angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up to confront Saul, but it was reported to Samuel. Saul went to Carmel where he set up a monument for himself. <laughs> then he turned around and went down to Gilgal. When Samuel came to him, Saul said, may the Lord bless you. You know, people can say all the right words, <laughs> but it's our heart. It's our actions that matter. I've carried out the Lord's instructions, Saul said. Samuel replied, then what is this sound of sheep, goats, and cattle I hear? Saul answered, the troops brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best sheep, goats, and cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we destroyed. Stop, exclaimed Samuel. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. You know, you guys, um, this is an issue uh, with my youngest son. I'm just going to call it out. <laughs> He's going to hate me for this. But we can have our want to's can rule over us if we think we know better. It is God who knows best. God. And he puts parents as authority. And so when we operate in a way of being under authority, I know that God, I trust God. He has my parents over me then we are blessed. And so when I look at the, the what Samuel's choices are here and his wording, I thought it was best. And so uh, we have to rule uh, our want to's and our will and put it underneath God's, right? Um, and so, you know, as our kids grow up, they start to realize that. 
that as they're following the leadership in the house, they're ultimately following God's leadership. So the scripture of the day is from 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23. Hey there, Kimberly. Hey, Vicki. Good to see you guys. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifice is your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So how about us? Man makes religion. Hey, we've all been religious at one time or another in our life. We think God should respect our offering, but we need to follow God's ways. He knows what's best. He's our Lord. If he is our Lord, we're going to want to follow his ways, not our own. God, that, God does not make rules for us because he's cruel, but because he loves us. Compromise and rationalization create separation between ourselves and God. And did you see how he described rebellion? It's as the sin of witchcraft. Do we consider rebellion in that definition? I think we kind of compromise and become worldly. And God is calling us to come out and be separate. We've got to be a witness right now to the world desperately needs to see us be faithful. May God help us to walk in his ways and not our own. Guys, thanks for sticking with me. This was a long one today, but I'm loving doing this Bible reading plan with you. Go with God, friends, and Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow.